Hey, what's happening? Oh, How we're on you? TV. Is that it? That's right. You know, I'm just so I'm too sexy for just to be contained to the radio, as as you are, of course. Well, I would have wore a hat because the problem is with my hairline. Yeah. And when I say line, uh-huh. that's being generous. There's no <laughs> line. The line has retreated. <laughs> yeah. It is. Uh, but the light hits me, and I look like a light bulb. Yeah. It just reflects right off. It just reflects off. Yeah. And. <laughs> uh, you know, it's you and I fine. Have both have fair, uh, fair. It's it's when you're in these bright lights, it's almost like you become translucent in yes. a way or something. Yeah. You know, it's it's you're you're you're. Uh, I've been tortured with this fair skin my entire life. Like you go to the beach or something. Do you even go to the beach? Things. I'm sure like that? black people listen to this going, "Oh, poor you. It <laughs> yeah. Must be tough being yeah. white." Yeah, white, white, my white privilege. No, uh, I go to the beach and hundred uh, percent Irish. So. I basically just burst into flames. Yeah. <laughs> it putting putting an Irish guy on the beach is like putting a fork in the microwave. Isn't it? I mean, you I always have to go if I go somewhere, even if it's just out for an hour outside. It's it's going to be outside. I have to have a plan for sunblock. Yeah. And like uh you know, other people Dieter, you don't have to you don't worry about that, do you? Not uh, for an hour. No. I mean, it was it's, all day maybe. Yeah, it's 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 no joke. So how have you been? You haven't been here in a while. No, well, last year I wasn't on tour as much because I uh, I write for that TV show Crashing on HBO. Right. And uh, so I was pretty I was pretty busy with that. So I've been here every year for God a good oh, twelve yeah, fifteen long time. years. Yeah, long time. And uh, so yeah, it's good to be back. Now, do you enjoy uh, uh, performing, doing stand up on the road, or or do you like the writing gigs? In a way, obviously, I'm I'm assuming performing in front of a live crowd is everyone you love that everyone yeah, loves that yeah. But 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 when you have a good writing gig, you're probably getting paid a decent amount of money. You get to be home. You get to be around the the, the family. You don't have to uh, travel to 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 Buffalo. Yeah, uh, that's the key. Know, things like that's that. That's the key. Yeah, and it is nice to be. <laughs> it's nice to be around them, and that's the goal. And then after about two months, I'm like. Calling my agent, like, you got anything in Buffalo? <laughs> you know, it, it's because it's like family is, they're great, but, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot. I have teenagers, and, you know, we, uh, yeah, you, you, when you started coming on the show, your kids were pretty, yeah, they were little, little and now, um, now, you, how many kids do you have? I have an 18 year old and a 15 year old. Okay, boys, girls? No, my, my daughter's 15, my son is 18, and my daughter, just this week decided to not talk to me oh, yeah? for the first time. What'd you do? Well, we'll get, what can you do? I try to sit her down. I try well, what, to, what caused you to, oh, why'd she I, stop I, talking to you? I was firm with, I didn't yell at her uh-huh. because you don't yell at uh, Generation Z. Uh-huh. You just kind of talk <laughs> to them. And I guess I was too stern. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can't win. You have to be best friends with them. Yes. You can't be a parent. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, so she's not talking <laughs> to me. And it actually really hurts. I really hate it. And it's like, I can, I can remember when she was younger, just wanting her to shut the hell up. <laughs> and now I want her to talk. Who's, who's more, I don't have any kids. Who's more difficult, uh, boys or girls? In, in a way, I mean, you, you, it seems as a guy, it would be easier to raise a boy. You no question. Know what you're in girls for. are way harder. Yeah. More emotional, right? More, more ups emotional. and downs. They have more issues with their friends. Yeah. Like my son plays sports. It's simple. Yeah. Here's the rules, and the rules kind of extend to friendships. Yeah. You know, you're either on the team or you're off the team. There's no, like, Females are trading players all the time. Yeah. There's free agency. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're constantly not knowing if your stats are good, yeah, if you're yeah. going to be kicked out. It's really cruel. It's very sad what happens to girls. And even if a boy, even if your son, if something did happen, some sort of drama between a couple of guys, he probably wouldn't tell you about it, I'm guessing. I no. mean, I, I remember when I was a teenager, you'd come home, your mom would go, what did what, you do today? Nothing. Yeah, you know, that was it. That was right. the extent of. It. I mean, I would tell my mom stuff, but it, it had to be at that point like really bad. Like, there's a guy threatening to shoot me, mom. You know, like he pulled a gun on me yesterday or something. Like, it would have to be something like that. I for remember you to when I was in when I was in eighth grade, I told my parents that there was a kid at school that was bringing a knife the next day to stab another kid. Uh, I told them that it's the only time I ever ratted somebody, and I regretted it. I got such a hard time from the other kids at school 
for ratting somebody out. So your parents didn't do it in a way they so they must have called the school or yeah. or something. They 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 didn't do it in such a way where it would protect your identity. Where, no, yeah, no. You sold me out. Yeah, <laughs> and you and were the rat of the neighborhood. For... I was the rat of the neighborhood, and you know it was the sharks and the jets, and I was thrown out of the sharks. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a Puerto Rican kid that was bringing a knife to school, and so uh, yeah. But I, I mean, we I grew up in a crazy. I grew up in New York, and I just grew up in a crazy situation where there was just a lot of. Uh, there was a lot of fighting. There was a lot of drugs. And I look at my kids now, and they're not going through that stuff. So easy, right? Yeah. I, I look back at, at uh, I always thought, I grew up in Las Vegas. I always thought, and, and, you know, we weren't, I had a single mother, but she she was a nurse. We are you know, lower middle class. Um, and uh, I, I always thought, like, oh, I had it pretty easy and pretty... But sometimes when I look back at it, I go, man, my high school experience, it was, it was rougher than maybe I was giving it credit for. Yeah. You know, there was a lot of gang activity in Las Vegas. I, I know there were kids that went to my school at, right across the street, got shot in the face as part right. of, like, a, you know, a get murdered and stuff. Really? Yeah, and it, it was, it was, um, it just it at the time though when you're going through it it didn't seem like it was that bad but then you look at some of these kids now and they're so coddled and uh, not everyone not all of them but I go wow they really have it easy today maybe I'm just getting older and grumpier. well do you think that in the end it was good for you to be raised that way um, like did it give you a certain yeah edge? Cause you, I think you have a little bit I, I think you had to always uh, have some some street smarts about right, you right right. And I'm a little guy. You're a little guy. Um, and, and, you know, we weren't going around. I couldn't go around uh, beating people up, pushing people around. So you had to use your mental wits right. to kind of survive. And I don't don't take don't take it the wrong way. I, I didn't go to like the worst high school in the world. I mean, I see these stories about kids even here in town. The schools are <laughs> the, the inner city schools are it's off the charts. You know, it yeah. wasn't it, it wasn't like that. Right. Uh, but. Yeah, I think you have a yeah. It was probably good in a way to to figure out how to navigate the world and survive. Well, now we've definitely like what they call helicopter pan parented yeah. our kids. I mean, we're just all over them. Yeah. And now they're saying that like they they want to do they call it free range parenting now. Yeah, the kid they'll just go off do go whatever off, you want to do. And I feel like we've gone more in that direction. Yeah. Which is uh, better for everybody, you know. I mean, it was like. Me and my wife didn't have sex because the kids were always home or we were like chaperoning them someplace. And now I like the free range parenting. I, you know, I throw a move on the wife two, three times a week now, <laughs> which is pretty sweet, you know? And it's like, you know, her body's still good. Were you worried when they were younger that they, that, that, that I always tell people like, like people will call up and I, I go, let your kids send them outside did the stuff i used to do as a kid you get on your bike yeah you would ride you wouldn't tell your parents you were doing it but you would drive like f ride five miles yeah. away Gone and all day. do all sorts of stuff you yeah as long as you came back at night right that it. was pretty much when the, the streetlights standard. came on right they would kick okay. me out they'd yeah. be like go it's right. 10 in the morning get out of the house right be home by dinner and now parents will call into the show and they go well you can't do that it's too dangerous out there for kids and you go give me a break no, it's, it's, not. it's not it's and, not but then you get like this this girl who was uh kidnapped the the, the what's her face Kloss, uh jamie Kloss, who was the guy went in and and where was that wisconsin or yeah. minnesota or something Guy goes in, kills the two parents, kidnaps her, keeps her for three months. And people see stories like but that. But you can't like, stop that. I, I, and you know what? There's 10 million kids in the country. What are the odds that's going to happen to your kid? Yeah. The same as they were 20 years ago, 50 years ago. Safer. It hasn't it's actually got, safer it's now, probably. It's probably safer because there's cameras everywhere right. and kids are a little bit more aware. But no, it's. I think it's a shame. I think we're robbing them of the creativity of just – improvising your way through a day because yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. You know, you hear that some kids are doing this. So you ride your bike down there and you hang out there and then some kids from the other town come over and maybe you meet them. Maybe you get in a fight with them, whatever. Yeah. You know, maybe you, you get under the bleachers with some girl and you get to <laughs> second base, maybe third base. She hashtag me Tuesday on Monday. You're seven. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, uh, now that you have teenagers, 
Do you have a new outlook on, like, I, I look at, back at some of the things I was doing. Like I said, I had a single mother, and I go, man, I don't know how you could do that. Uh, you know, I started having sex. I was 15 years old. Yeah. Do you have a different outlook on things now that you have teenagers and you're you're looking at them as they sort of navigate that world of growing up and becoming sexually active and all of that? It's well, I, I looked in my son's room and I looked in his drawer for something. I wasn't snooping, but I opened his drawer to his dresser and it was, I didn't find a box of condoms. I found a drawer full of condoms. <laughs> it, it looked like a uh, Planned Parenthood <laughs> clinic. You know, they were just, and I was just like, good. Yeah. You know what? If he's going to have sex, he's doing it safe. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And then with my daughter, who's 15, I really do feel like there's a double standard. Like, I'd be horrified if I knew she was having sex. Right. You know? And uh, I, I don't know. I, it's, it's, it is different. Sure. You know? But I'm glad they're living a life. You know, my daughter surfs. So she gets up. We live in Venice Beach. So she gets up and she goes to the beach at 6 o'clock in the morning before school. And the water's like 49 degrees. Yeah. And it's like 50 degrees out. And she puts on her wetsuit. And she goes out there and she surfs for an hour before school. Wow. And, so, and then, you know, and they go out. They definitely, we have definitely allowed them to start going out. They, you know, in Venice Beach, there's, uh, do they have the scooters here now that you can rent scooters? Yeah, those, those like bird scooters the bird and scooters. Line scooter, yeah. So they can go wherever they want anytime. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we trust them. We keep in touch. We got to find my uh, phone thing on her phone. Right, right. So we know where she is at any given time. Right. And, uh. You know, we gotta. You gotta let them grow. You gotta let them get ready to. Uh, is there any difference now? Like you mentioned, hashtag Me Too. Is there? You have an eighteen-year-old son. Is, is there anything that you impart to him in this day and age, or do they look at things differently? Like I, I look at it and I go, Whew. I wasn't doing anything creepy. I wasn't, you know, uh, uh, assaulting little, girls little or anything. Creepy, well, you know, uh, what, what people consider creepy, yeah. uh, probably we didn't consider creepy right. back in the day. Uh, but you know, I wasn't assaulting chicks or things like that, but, but you look at some of the stuff now and there's such a sensitivity and, and, and there's so, I don't know. I wonder what it would be like to be an 18 year old boy these days. Right. Well, when stuff comes up in the news about like, um, college kids, you know, being accused of rape because a girl was drunk. And I say to my son, if a girl's drinking hands off, that's it. Period. Yeah. Because that opens you up to. You know the what could be the end of your life. Yeah. You know, literally, that you will follow be marked. You. Even that if you weren't, if you, you end up that you're found innocent, or that they 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 drop the charges, right. or whatever the case may be. Right. Someone does a Google search uh, ten, fifteen years from now and sees your kid's name. Uh, right. They're not gonna. You wouldn't hire that someone nope. like that. Probably, nope. I'm guessing. Uh, you just wouldn't want to take the chance. Yeah. No, it's you're gambling a lot to just have one moment. Isn't it amazing when you think about sex, like touching and all that is nice, but it really comes down to a 20 second orgasm <laughs> and how much you put on the line, oh, man, yeah. the clothes you buy, the car you lease, you know, the dinners and the, all that for this 20 seconds. Do you remember when you were like your son's age, just how that consumed? I mean, still as a man, we love yeah, sex. I mean, right. But I'm talking, it consumed every <laughs> yeah. waking minute right, right. of your life. Yeah. I don't even know how boys could go to school and learn anything because the whole time at school, I the, all I was thinking about were the chicks in school. Yeah. And do you know? Do I look dorky? You know, like yeah. I w It was just all consuming. It, all for what? How many times did you have sex in high school? <sighs> uh, I actually had sex quite a bit. I had. Yeah. A, I, I started having sex when I was fifteen. I had a girlfriend, and yeah. I don't know. Probably by the time I got out of high school. Jeez, I don't know. How many I probably, girls? I would say probably eight to That's ten. Good. That's probably. good. Probably, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. solid. Um, Those are good numbers. Yeah, I mean, not yeah, not bad. Not I, bad. But For a small I'm not guy? a good looking guy. No. You, you, that's another thing. Like you have to learn yeah. how to. Like these days, the 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 kids, the 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 guys have no game because they they meet a chick, they don't say anything to her, and then they find her on Facebook two days later, and yeah. they're like, "Hey, what are you doing? Right? Netflix and chill." Like right. you don't have to talk to anyone. Yeah. to try and score. And I think that we grew up. I'm a little older than you, but we came up. Uh, there was AIDS. Yeah, and you know, not that there's no AIDS now, but it's not something that plays into like kids aren't using condoms. Yeah. The way they used to. Yeah. Like STDs are way up. Yeah. And just hooking up is through the roof. Kids are way more sexually. Actually, I don't know the numbers statistically, 
But it's, it seems to me that they're having a lot more sex. I've actually, I saw a study not too long ago that said that they're having less sex. Really? Yeah, because they are, um, A, a lot of the boys, there's such access to porn right. now. I mean, it is just, <laughs> I, I can't even imagine when I was a kid if we had Pornhub. Remember how hard porn. it was to find porn? You couldn't, I mean, it was like. I never watched porn it was, growing up. Yeah. You, that was, it was always a constant search for porn, and now they just have it. Anytime they in, want, in any their second. pocket, yeah. wherever they could go into a bathroom at school and watch porn, they could do whatever they want right. to do. You were talking about getting through school. How do they get through school when they could just be watching porn the whole time? Is yeah. it a fourteen-year-old yeah. yeah. kid? Yeah. Uh, so because of of that and uh, and just video games and social media, that they are spending m way more time doing that stuff right. than actually. Having sex, right? So I I don't know if that's true or not. Who knows? Probably a study will come out next week saying they're having more sex than ever. I don't know, but yeah. I mean, I I don't know how many I had sex a bunch of times in high school, but manual stimulation yeah. <laughs> was constant. <laughs> yeah. For some reason, in my high school, it was like it was not. It was a handshake, literally. Yeah. yeah. It was a shake of the hand. Yeah. And and you know, so I sort of feel like that's how it should be in high school. There shouldn't be. Intercourse is pretty intense. That should be safe for once you're over 18. That's what you're saying as, a, yeah, as an nah, adult yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. That's not <laughs> what you were thinking when you were right. 16, 17, yeah, right. 18. With a 15 year old yeah. daughter. Yeah. 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 I just remember the first time I had sex, I was 15. And, and like after the fact, the next day or later that night, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I've gone 15 years of my life yeah. without that. Yeah, right, wow, right. wow, like a whole new world opened Mine up. Mine was the least romantic. I was, uh, I had a bet with my buddy Pete, Sneaky Pete Cars, uh -huh. and we had a bet <laughs> that whoever lost, we were, we were, I think we were, I think I was 16, I was just 16 when I lost my virginity, and uh, we had a bet since we were like 15, whoever lost their virginity first got 20 bucks from the other guy. Yeah. It was like a bad movie. Yeah. And so he ends up sleeping with this girl, and she was she was a little bit loose. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of felt like, uh, you know, anybody could have done that. Mm -hmm. That you shouldn't get to twenty. So I said, all right, we I get a week. I get a week to now to have match sex with it. somebody. Yeah. Uh -huh. So about five days later, I'm hanging out. We used to hang out at the bleachers downtown, and kids would drive by. And so she comes driving by with this other girl in a Camaro. It was like a it was like a '78 Camaro, mm -hmm. and they picked us up. And we went and we got some Boone's Farm strawberry. Wine. Oh yeah, of course. And then we drove out, and it was like a <laughs> there was like a, a mud road under the power lines, and it was drizzling out. So the mud ray was muddy, and we were. I just remember Led Zeppelin four was playing, and uh, Johnny Trouble, my buddy, was on the back hood of the car, I on the trunk of the car. I was on the hood with this girl. It was the same girl my friend lost his Oh, my God. To. Wow. And I had my pants around my ankles. <laughs> I grunted one out. <laughs> loveless. <laughs> and then I told him the next day, I was like, that's canceled. <laughs> and I didn't tell him who it was with. <laughs> and he never, never found out, huh? He's gay now. Oh, wow. No kidding. Yeah. Really? Yep. And you had no... Uh, I lost to a gay guy. You had no <laughs> inkling at the time that he was gay. Not only that. He was like my best friend. We went to Europe together for six months after we graduated high school. Hitchhiked together, slept in tents. Getting chicks and stuff, too? He never hit on me. Really? I'm hurt. I'm hurt. <laughs> You're not that attractive. No. Wow. That's, that, isn't that crazy? It is crazy, and uh, it makes me sad that he, because he slept with girls. I, I would always hook him up. Like, yeah. I'd be with a girl. She'd have a friend. I'd hook him up. He'd have sex with her. Yeah. So I think he was just... Either he's bi or he was just trying to cover it up. It wasn't as accepted as, as it is. You know, back then it wasn't as accepted no. as it is now. No. Like, you know, now it's like, it's, I It's don't cool know. now. Yeah. Yeah. It's no big deal yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, but back in the day, uh, I mean, you can't even say that's gay anymore because, you know, you'll be run out of town if you say that. As, or as here's a, what I noticed recently is that when somebody said, are you gay back, back when we were growing up? Those were fighting words. Yeah. What are you gay? Yeah. And now if they go, are you gay? You have to answer in a non-judgmental <laughs> way. Like it's not like it's not a bad thing. You have yeah. to go like, no, <laughs> no, I'm not gay. No, but but not that I have a problem yeah. with it. Or yeah. overcompensate. Yeah. Like, no, 
Damn it. <laughs> Disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Greg Fitzsimmons is here with us. He is at Hilarities tonight at 8 o'clock and also Friday and Saturday, 7 and 9.30 on those shows. Uh, so you've been writing for that HBO show. Right. I got to be honest, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, well, it's a Judd Apatow show. It's called Crashing. And uh, What's it about? It, it's premise. about a, a struggling comedian who's like breaking in in New York. And his buddy is, uh, Artie Lang is on the show a lot. Dave Attell's on a lot. Colin Quinn. So it's very much in that, like, comedy cellar world of New York City. And uh, and it's cool. Like, Sarah Silverman, we got John Mulaney was on last season. And Bill Burr was on. So it's a lot of stories about, you know, we basically sit around the writer's room. And a lot of the writers are for, former comedians. Mm -hmm. And instead of coming up with stories out of thin air, we literally just say... Yeah, I was on the road one time. Life Guy stiffed me, pulled a gun on me, and we tell real stories. Right. And then we sort of pick the good ones and we make episodes out of right, it. Right, right. And, and uh, yes, Charlie, you look like well, you I'm just wondering because Artie's, I, I love that show. It's really good. But Artie's throughout all of these episodes, but he looks pretty rough right currently. I don't know. Is he going to be in the third season? Well, the third season we taped already. That comes out oh, okay. January 20th. And then the next season we'll start taping in spring and summer. Assuming we get picked up, mm -hmm. we won't know until this show airs. Um, but a full intention of hiring him again. I mean, he, he shows up, he gets the job done. He's a great actor, great guy. I've known him. I, did the, I used to do the Stern show with him. I did Stern like 50 times. And every time we did it, me and Artie would go hang out afterwards. We'd go get breakfast and hang out all day. So I'm, I'm pretty close to him, and I really love the guy. And I'm really pulling for the guy. Um, and he's... He's got one of those constitutions, yeah. one of those like jur just Italian guy from Jersey who can just put whatever he wants in his body. And granted, he looks horrible. Oh my God! Yeah, that, like that picture of his nose, you know, yeah. going around. You're like, holy yeah. smokes! Well, basically, the story is that he was chopping up some coke with a salt shaker, a glass salt shaker, and it chipped, and he knew it chipped. But he didn't want to lose the cocaine. Oh, you're kidding me. So he me. snorted it anyway. Oh, my God. And so he got glass in his nose. Oh, my God. And it got infected. And so he's had surgeries on his nose over time. Oh, my and God. And then I don't know what happened recently, but it doesn't, it doesn't look great. It's oh, like collapsing. God. Yeah. It's different than the, before it was big, and now it's collapsing in on itself. How realistic is his uh, character? What's, how would you compare his character to his real life in that show? Is it very similar? Um... Yeah, you know, it, it's similar in the sense that he talks pretty openly about his addiction, and he really is actively trying to do something about it um, with limited results, but he's trying, and uh, but he's a real friend. He's a friend, you know, like he's a very loyal guy, and like he's the kind of guy you'll go to a gig and he will remember the door guy's name. He'll know the, 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 the freaking busboy's name, and he's kind to everybody. He's just He's just a really... Decent, good guy. You have to acknowledge his nose in the next season, right? If yeah. If he comes back. Yeah, but there's no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't, we don't yeah, hide right. anything. Okay. I mean, I, it's, that's the thing about the show is like, we kind of have a line that if you're under, we don't use your real name, like a, a line of celebrity. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, I think some comedians get upset about it that they, we don't use their real name. It's like, right. you, you're not a name. And then, and then, but if you, if it is your name, we stay pretty true to who you are in real life. Mm hmm. Yeah, it, it uh, you know, I guess the you say he's trying to uh to 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 beat the addiction. Some people just don't want to though. Right. You know what I mean? It's like they, they go through the motions because everyone's telling them get better, right. do this, do that and some people just, you know, I, what can you do? Yeah. Right? I mean, you can't can't force someone to clean up. You can't make someone do anything that they don't want to do, you know, I guess. And uh if the guy shows up to work, uh, and he gets the job done, and he does a good performance, and uh, you know, I guess you keep hiring him. I, I remember uh, uh, Scott Weiland from Stone Temple Pilots, who died of a drug overdose right before he died. He played uh, we do, at, at Roverfest, the festival that we do every year, and I don't remember what I paid the guy. Uh, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. But you you look, you think about it, and you go, did 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 I in a way? subsidize this guy's death uh because you you continue to pay someone who is obviously uh completely addicted to 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 substances and 
I, I, you know, what are you going to do, though? I don't know. I, I don't have an answer for that. It's a tricky one, and we've talked about it, you know, on the show. And uh, and I think it's what you said. If you can show up and do the job, then um, I don't know what you really do about it. Um, and and just firing a guy, not paying a guy, you go, well, then he, that, that I don't think it's going to make a guy go, oh, I got to clean up my act. I got to get it together. And right. you know, that's not going right. to, I don't know if that's going to do it. It may give him less money to buy drugs, I suppose, but I don't think he's hurting for money. Anyways. Right. And as as a friend, the only thing you can do is just say, you know, I can't. I can't change this guy. Now, if you're somebody, like there's a certain comedian in New York who has been a sponsor to a lot of comics that have been in trouble with substances. And he's an amazing guy. And you know him. He's a pretty famous comedian, but I don't want to out him. But he's a big program guy. Somebody like that can step in and try to try to help. Mm -hmm. But for the average person, you don't have the resources or the language or the understanding of disease to be able to help them. And so, you know, you try to just engage. You try to stay their friend if you can. And uh, and I guess it extends to professionally, you know, that um, that, you know, like you said, if they get the job done, then you respect that and you you let them work. I never really uh, got too into drugs. Did you? I mean, you were you were yeah. doing comedy clubs and stuff. No, I've been sober for uh, 27 years. So when you were younger, it's it's just, you know, I guess in the scene, probably. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, as a comedian, it's. Hard not to. You're working in a bar every night yeah. where you get free drinks. Yeah. And cocaine is like a big deal. We did a lot of cocaine. And, uh, you know, there were gigs where you got paid in cocaine. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> there was a club in Boston where you got paid in cocaine. And it was like you'd sit at the bar. The, the comics went on strike because they told us we couldn't cut lines at the bar. But we wanted to be at the bar so we could watch the other comedians. Yeah, yeah. And they wanted us to go in the green room. Yeah. And we went on strike. Because you wanted to be out there in public yes. cutting up your lines. Yes. And you're like, how unreasonable yeah, are they right, being right. that we can't go out and do I know. this? Yeah. We're artists. <laughs> and, and then, you know, the amount of drinking. And get, and so I went on stage drunk um, a bunch of times. But the, 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 the day I quit drinking, December 4th, 1989, and I was... Uh, I was on stage and it was a thing called tits for tots. And it was a benefit they did every Christmas for the children's hospital. And they got all the strippers and the hookers because Nick's comedy stop was in the, the uh, theater district in the red light zone mm -hmm. of, of downtown Boston. Mm -hmm. And so we, the hookers would come into the club after, after their shift or between shifts and they'd hang out and the strippers would come in. And so we all knew each other. And so they would walk around topless in the comedy club at noon on a Friday and they would, uh, they'd walk around with, uh, hats and the comedians would be on stage doing comedy. And it was all union guys, like tough Southie Boston guys, right. like, come on Fitzy. <laughs> and they would sit there and drink pitchers and do shots of Jameson's while these girls walked around topless with hats and people would put cash in and they'd raise money for the children's hospital. The children had no idea where the money came from. <laughs> um, and so, so, I got, so I was sitting there with some buddies that I played hockey with, and I drank a bunch of pitchers, and I went on stage, and I sucked. And I bombed in front of the toughest group of 300 guys you could imagine. And it made me feel so ashamed. And I'd, I'd tried to stop before that a bunch of times. And I realized at that moment, like, stand-up meant everything to me. And it was like the first thing I really felt like I could do well. Mm -hmm. I was never a good student. It was, I was never a good athlete. But stand-up, I knew I was good at. And I realized it wasn't going to work if I drank. And that was it. I never, I've never had a uh, drink you, since. It, it, just cold turkey. Cold turkey. That was it. Yeah. And, and Went to some meetings, you know. Yeah. yeah. Because your dad was uh, an alcoholic, right? If My I dad was correctly. an alcoholic. Good memory. Yeah. So I, I was familiar with the program because I'd gone to Al-Anon meetings because of my dad. So when I quit drinking, I was able to take those same 12 steps and just kind of transition into, you know, doing the program. And, uh, you know, and it, it really changed my life. I really am very grateful. I don't think I would have a healthy family life and uh, I wouldn't have a career and my health. You know, my dad died at 52. Mm. He was a radio guy. Yeah. I do remember that. Yeah, and yeah. And was it in New York or Boston? In New York. In New York, he was yeah. a radio guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so what, what do you tell your kids? Do your kids drink? I mean, how do you, how do you navigate that? Because you know, my son is 18, and he's only come home and thrown up once. Yeah. And that's, that's not bad. <laughs> that's not bad at all. So, like, you know, he, he has a car, and he, if he goes out, he'll take an Uber at night. 
yeah. if he's going to drink. So much easier to to not drink right. and drive these days, right. isn't right. it? I mean, I remember the stuff I did back in high school. It was so stupid. Oh, I drank. I drove drunk all. Oh, me too. The time. Yeah, yeah. A couple nights a week. Yeah, it really dumb stuff. That, yeah. That, and I I can re- even remember kids in my high school, uh, you know, getting an accident. Some of them died, and it still it wouldn't it might shut you down for, for a couple weeks yeah. exactly right right and, and you then go you right would back to it. you'd go and we would go uh, like on road trips sometimes from vegas to uh i remember going to utah our big plan was uh we're going to go pick up some chicks in utah now why i don't know cuz they're all mormon <laughs> out there and it's so stupid i yeah. i mean this is how desperate you are for poon back then it's like uh, going out to buy non alcoholic <laughs> beer <laughs> yeah so st- yeah so why and then drive back all that way, which is, I don't know, it was a couple hour drive. Drunk. Yeah. Drunk. I mean, right. it's just, it was so, so yeah. stupid. Uh, but, you know, whatever. I guess. Uh, we, used to drive, we used to drive in the Bronx and we would go to uh, projects and we would buy angel dust, Coke. And we were sitting there in the car, you know, four white guys yeah. sitting in the car. And we guy would come out and you'd give him money and he'd go inside. Sometimes they'd bring you into the project and you'd get the drugs in there. It was insane were you ever scared over that kind of, course. of stuff? yeah yeah but of you course. wanted the drugs but yeah. we wanted the drugs and we did it what would your dad have done if you would have gotten popped for a dui or something when you were a kid because he's he, he was a an alcoholic would yeah he have, would he have been well i got arrested a few times but i spent the week he let me sit in jail for a weekend for uh i got in a fight drunk mm-hmm. in front of the police station oh there smart was, there was a bar next to the police station and it was uh it was called the tarry Inn. And there was this this old Irish guy named Joe. And when you went in there, Joe, and we were like 15, 16 years old, and he would buy us drinks because he had an apartment upstairs. Mm-hmm. And so he would fill you full of beer and shots. And then at the end of the night, he'd go, ah, you boys are too drunk to be going home. You'll come upstairs and you'll ah, stay in my apartment. Uh-huh. And we never did, but he always held out hope that one night, <laughs> one of us was going to go up there. And so I'm there one night and I'm like, I can't remember if I'm 15 or 16. And I'm in there, and I'm drunk. And then this kid Eddie Flacco, who was like this, uh, just a just a dropout loser, and he started a fight with us, me and my friend Brian Van Horn. And we'd been studying martial arts for like six months, so we thought we were badasses. Uh-huh. And so Joe breaks up the fight, throws Eddie Flacco out, and then he says, "I'll buy you guys another pitcher. You shouldn't be leaving yet. You let Eddie Flacco go on his way." And so we drink some more, and then we go to leave, and Eddie Flacco's waiting for us. Yeah, and he pulls out. A switch, not a switchblade, a switch comb. He pulls a switch comb on us. I can never forget that. And he comes at us with a switch comb. And so me and my friend Brian threw some Taekwondo moves on him. And he were on the hood of a car fighting Eddie Flacco. And the cops just literally, no car, just walked out just and arrested right us. Out, yeah. And they put us in a jail cell. And uh, I remember I was wising off. I was screaming at them. And, and the cop came in and he grabbed me by my hair from outside the cell and he just kept slamming my head against the side of the cell. I had blood coming down my face because he ripped my hairline. And uh, and they, I called my parents and they said, yeah, when does the judge come in? I was like, Monday. And they're like, all right, we'll see you on Monday. <laughs> oh, wow. And then they didn't even come on Monday. Wow. I had to call my friend who sent his mother down to bring the bail. Yeah. And she was a waitress and she came down with like a stack of quarters <laughs> and singles and bailed me out with her waitressing money. So did it, did it, uh, did you learn your lesson from that? No, or? no, no, no. Got to spend two more weekends in jail after that. What'd you, what else did you do? Did... Always drunk and fighting. Yeah. I used to fight all the time. Are you, were you a bad drunk or are you one of those guys? Like I become a, I'm a happy drunk. I yeah. become more outgoing. I'm not an outgoing person. In fact, I, I'm very, very quiet yeah. outside of the show. Yeah. Shy. No. People think uh, Rover's a dick. He's stuck up. Yeah. No, I'm just, I'm just shy and right, quiet. Right. And uh uh but when I get drunk, as you've seen, Dieter, I'm Very I'm a loud. friendly drunk. No, I, I'm a I friendly drunk. I get really funny, ball busty, but in a fun way. And then uh but then if somebody offends me, a a, a switch just flips and I get super, super angry and yeah. violent. Yeah. 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 Which my father was also. Yeah. My father used to come home. I remember being a kid and my father, I'd wake up in the morning, my dad would have a black eye and he got, he got DUIs. And, um, I remember one time we were in a bar in Manhattan and he goes, and I was probably like 19 or something. And he goes, you see that guy over there with the, with the blue hat? And he goes, find out his name. And I was like, why? And he's like, I'm going to have him killed. 
and he was drunk. Yeah. So he didn't mean it, but yeah, yeah. that's the way his mind worked. Yeah. When he was drunk. That's crazy. Yeah. And he he was uh uh well, he was an abusive guy, right? If yeah. I remember correctly. Yeah. He used to hit us. To, to, he would hit you. Yeah. Your mother too, or no? No. No. Just no. just the kids. Just the kids. And uh, your mother didn't. Uh, Mrs. Fitzsimmons didn't uh, didn't tell him, "Hey, knock it nope. off." Or, wow. No, because she'd been beaten, he'd been beaten, and it was just the culture. You know, yeah. it was that generation where it was they they consider. And you know, it's pretty amazing the percentage of people that still think it's okay to hit your kids. Well, I think there's a difference. You know, there's a debate about spanking, of of, right. of course, but uh, there's a difference between coming home drunk and you get pissed off. And you take it out on your kids as yeah. opposed to spanking them to discipline them. Right. You know, I, I think there's a, a big difference there. Yeah. And uh, I don't. No, you really. I think putting your putting your hands on a kid is a slippery slope. Yeah. Because to me, it's always like, all right, why are you doing it? Do you truly believe you're going to change this kid's behavior, or are you pissed off so you're venting? Uh, again, I don't have kids, so it's hard for me to, to I think comment that, on it, but. I think it's always a combination of the two. Yeah. And I think that if you really want to raise a good kid, you want to raise them to feel safe. And when you are the primary caregiver for a child and that child looks to you for your food, sustenance, housing, safety, and you then turn on them and you physically hurt them in an angry way, I think that does a real number on a kid's head. Yeah. I think it's very destructive. So you never spanked no, your kids No, never ever. put a hand on them. No. And I know this ha half your listeners statistically right now are listening to me and going, what a pussy. Greg Fitzsimmons is a yeah, pussy. Right, right. <laughs> but, you know, every every study they've done yeah. shows that it is not a fa it's not an effective way of disciplining a kid and that it has real repercussions. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't have any kids, but uh, I remember when I was a kid <clears> – <throat> That it was a real deterrent. Yeah, getting spanked, you know, and I, I was spanked only up until maybe like the age of five or six or yeah. something like that. And then uh, I lived with, you know, I had a single mother, and we, we on and off we'd live with with my grandparents because my mom was, uh, you know, didn't have much money as a single mother. So uh, one time, my grandfather, who was also an alcoholic, uh, who I was very close with, and he had always been a real ball buster to his own kids, uh, very, uh, I don't know if I would say abusive, but super uh, temper, like off the charts. But then I was born, <laughs> my mom was 17 when she had me. I was born and everyone was like amazed, at least the stories that my, my family has told me, a complete turnaround when it came to me. He was yeah. so nice, so gentle. Right, right. He, and he, he affectionate, zero of that with his own kids um and then one day i was probably 10 or so uh he was drunk and uh i i went up to him with this pad of paper <clears throat> and it said uh, uh it was a regular size notebook note notepad and it said legal pad of paper and i was asking him why you know like legal pads are usually the longer paper I go, why does it say legal pad when it's a regular? For whatever reason, he's like, I, I don't know. He just starts yelling at me. And I'm like, well, what? And I, I took it like one question too far, and he flipped out and started, you know, uh, took me in the room and was spanking me. Like, uh, you know, like a madman. Yeah. Never forgave him. Right. Ne never, uh, right. uh, from that day forward, I never. It's a betrayal. Almost didn't talk to him for the rest of, of my life. I think a relationship never recovers once you hit a kid. I think that they feel so betrayed by that. And, uh, and again, go look inside. Are you doing it because you think it's constructive or are you angry and yeah. you're venting? Because would you do it to me today? You know, would, would my dad, if he were alive today, do it to me today? No, I beat the crap out of him. <laughs> so he did it because he could get away with it. Yeah, yeah. Do you, uh, um, I, I thought of you, I think it was you that told, me. maybe it wasn't. Someone who used to write for Ellen, you used to write on Ellen's show. Yeah. And uh, my old phone screener who worked on the show for, what, 10 plus years, yeah. uh, his, his uh, girlfriend went on, uh, she went, in, it was in the audience of the Ellen show about a month or two ago, 
and they played a game with her. And then, like, she was freaked out so much that they kept bringing her back. She's been on the show, like, three times. Are you serious? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, three times. And they actually sat her in the seat there. Unbelievable. And and all of that. And she, this this girl, obsessed with Ellen, has been for years. She's, you know, she's young, too. What is she, like, 20, 20s, mid, like, mid-20s or women something? Women get obsessed with Ellen. She, I mean, loves Ellen. And maybe it wasn't you. I don't know. But I, I was talking to her about it because she called up. Uh, we had her on on the show on the phone after she was, you know, became this viral video uh, uh, off of the Ellen show. And I said, I heard Ellen is a real bitch uh, behind the scenes. She, no, no way. Ellen is so kind and and she's just the best. And uh I, I don't know if it was you or someone else on the show. I, I just remember years ago, someone, and there have been a lot of people that have written for the Ellen Show, a lot of comics, I think. But I remember one of the people telling me, oh, she's, she's impossible to work for. She was a real bitch. Uh, so so when, I, I, when you came in and I, I was looking through your cell, oh, yeah, you used to write for Ellen. It well, made I me think a, of her. Uh... I have a non-disclosure agreement. Oh, oh. So I'm not at liberty to, to discuss, discuss Ellen. Yeah, Ellen. <laughs> I um, I I once spoke on the air about it, and I got a cease and desist. You're kidding me, really, yeah. really. So it's serious. And and so even years after the fact, does that is that is a non-disclosure like that in effect for eternity? Oh yeah. Really. Yeah. And is that a that's but that's common, I guess, in the entertainment industry. No, that, no, it's not to to have these non-disclosure no. agreements now. Uh, Jet, uh, Judd Apatow doesn't have a non-disclosure agreement with <laughs> no, you. No, <laughs> I'll talk crap about him all day. <laughs> uh, Bill Maher, you wrote for his show. Oh, yeah. I, I love Bill Maher. I like no his show No non-disclosure agreement. No non-disclosure. Pain in the ass. Um, Charlie, uh, my sound guy, hates Bill Maher. Can't yeah. stand his show. I like his HBO show. I think it's I think it's. I, I think, think it's the really guy, good. look, to me, to have a show where, and I, I, don't, I don't care if you're on the right or the left, if you've got a, a point of view and you're able to go out and make it funny week in and week out, to me that's like you, you've done a good job. And I think he does that. Yeah. But is he a decent person? Is he a nice guy? No. No, he's a pain in the nuts. Yeah. Huh? Um, the, be- the best show that you ever wrote for, what did you have the most fun doing? I would say probably uh, Lucky Louie on HBO. Yeah. Louis C.K.'s first sitcom. And it was uh, – because I think it was so close to home for me, and we had, uh, you know, very similar lives. We lived in the same neighborhood. We started in Boston together, lived in New York together, lived in the same neighborhood in Venice Beach together. Our wives were good friends. Kids were the same age. Kids went to the same school. And so the show was about our lives. It was about his life, but I lived the same life. So it was effortless to write for. We had a great writing staff, and I was proud of the show. When all that stuff came out about him, I mean, you, yeah, you, it sounds like you've known him for a very long time. Yeah. You probably knew some of this stuff. Uh, when it blew up, what were your thoughts? Well, yeah, I mean, we'd all heard rumors about it before. And um, I think it's funny when you hear rumors. It's almost like, you know, when you hear priest jokes growing up. Yeah, priest and the altar boy walk into the confessional, <laughs> and you laugh and yeah. you laugh, and then you read a story about pedophilia with a priest, and you go, "That's the sickest thing I've ever heard." So there was this transition from rumor to reality that made us all kind of stop and go, "Oh wow, this has really affected people in a bad way." Um, so it was disturbing, you know. He's my friend, so I stand by him as a friend, but I certainly I was disappointed. In hearing this stuff and um you know i think he did apologize initially people felt that he should have apologized more before he went back to stand up um i don't know jury's out on that i mean this is what the guy does for a living he's got so he it. started doing comedy again a lot of people said too soon he should be blackballed for a for what a, for a period of time but, but what's or the period of time yeah yeah you know i mean who's to decide that he what he does for a living. He mm-hmm. sat he sat in his house for a year or nine months or whatever. I think he probably should have should have come out with more of a statement about what he'd learned 
what he'd done, give some money to a charity, reach out personally. But you what know, it, there was things what it be done. sincere, do you think? I always see like these athletes and people, you know, they, they do something and then a statement is released and you go, yeah, that guy can barely speak. I've seen him on TV. He didn't write that statement. Um, yeah, but you're in entertainment. What is sincere? You know, how much of what you do is sincere? You got yeah. There's certain things you have to do that are part of your career. I know, but I think that's such BS that, that people like, I, I, I've never apologized for anything I've ever said, and I've had a lot of pressure to apologize. Yeah, for but the, you didn't cross a line. Yeah, I, I'm he sure. He crossed right, a line, right, right, and I right. think that he does feel bad about it. I know for a fact that he was going to therapy about it, and I, and I know that he's had growth about it. And I know he's he genuinely feels remorse, and I think he should have come out and said that more. Yeah, yeah. Um, How do you feel about Judd Apatow going after Louis C.K. after the after his stand up got leaked? I don't know. I think that's between Judd and Louis. Puts you in a weird spot. <laughs> <laughs> puts Greg Greg Fitzsimmons yeah. right in the middle yeah. of this. Uh, yeah. Of uh, what did he do? What did what did uh, Judd said, say? Uh, it's hacky, unfunny, shallow routine. Is just a symptom of how people are afraid to feel empathy, on and on and on. But because he made fun of, um, we made a joke about the uh, the Parkland shooting, or not, maybe not specifically the Parkland shooting, but school shooters in general. And I think it was about the Parkland was shooting specifically, and, and, and specifically of hey, you went through a school. I don't remember exactly. I'm paraphrasing. You went through a school shooting, but why? Why should I listen to you? Why you know? Why but should you joke. be able to get on TV and then the gender non-binary pronouns. That was also, they had an issue with that. Everyone has an issue with that, yeah. but it's just, it's a politically correct thing. You can't say so. I mean, it's ridiculous, some of the, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, but does that put you in, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. You probably yes, never uh, have to know, deal with it. I, I mean, it's not like you're going to be in the middle of that. You know, I get a, I get enough uh, having to talk about my own opinions about it. Yeah. I can't yeah. start having opinions about other people's opinions. Yeah. I, is there a lot of... Uh, um, are there a lot of cliques in the comedy world like that, where some people are on one side or group? Well, this or is whatever? a very divisive issue. This is definitely polarized people. You know, there is a contingent of comics that feel um, that you know he should have dealt with it differently, and I think there's a contingent of comics that just will never forgive him. A lot of female comics. And then there's some that feel like guys should be able to say whatever they want and do whatever they want, and it's sort of unbridled. And mm -hmm. that's a very reactionary group that, you know, I don't know. It's it's definitely it's it's something that people talk about a lot. Yeah. Uh, Greg Fitzsimmons is here with us. He'll be at Hilarities tonight at, at, at 8 o'clock. Friday and Saturday at 7 and 9.30. So, um... I know you do a podcast, right? Yeah, it's Dog Radio. Um, I know. Are you, do you still have a show on Sirius? No, that just ended about a month ago, after ten years. All the money you must have banked from that. I mean, what are you going <laughs> to? <laughs> I know. I don't even know why I'm here working. I I, I yeah, know. I have to laugh. I feel always think like unless your name's Howard Stern, yeah. you're, you're not really getting much right, money right. over over there at uh, at Sirius. But uh, it was a good gig, though. It was good. Are you going to miss that? What happened? They yeah, just I will. I will miss it. You know, it was a for a comedian where every week for me is you're scrapping, you're scrambling nothing's consistent and then to have something that every monday night without fail for 10 years i was doing i kind of enjoyed that mm -hmm. and i like the people i worked with um so uh yeah i'll definitely miss it but you know for a while howard has two two channels 100 and 101 and he had a uh, programming on 101 for years he had like i don't know 15 20 shows and one by one they started dropping them and it got down to um it was just me for the last year. I was the last show. So, you know. So I, the handwriting, you, it yeah, wasn't a I just, surprise. Yeah, I kept waiting for it to happen. But when it did, I was very bummed out. And they treated me great over there. And I'll, uh, I have nothing but good memories. But so I started a new podcast instead called uh, Childish. You know, Allison Rosen, she used to be, mm -hmm. she used to be Adam Carolla's sidekick. So she has. A, On the radio? Yeah. Okay. So she has a, no in real life. He just <laughs> she would just walk around near him, buy him cotton candy. <laughs> so so uh, she has a two year old, and she's got another one on the way. So it's basically me trying to tell her how to parent, and she's not really buying it. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot of call ins, and 
It's uh, so it's fun. We've been doing that for like eight eight weeks, and it's on the charts. It's doing really well. Does she spank her kid? She does not no. spank her okay. kid. Right. Yeah. Someone I said, maybe I'm getting this wrong. I watched this uh, uh, special, this Neil Brennan, uh, who had uh, three mics. Yeah. I watched that only because someone else was on the show and they mentioned that to me because I was having a conversation with whatever, whoever it was, whatever comedian it was. And I said, man, I mean, Netflix, God bless them. But holy mackerel, every comedian has a, a thing on there. It's, it's, it, and, and to be honest with you, I, I don't know, varying degrees, I think of, of, uh, funniness and talent and i'm not saying that in a bad way i'm just I, what i mean by that is not a, i don't know how <laughs> yeah, i think you're saying good it way. in a bad way but uh, no i guess what i'm saying is maybe it's it's pretty cheap to produce a comedy special yeah um and maybe some of these you know in a, in a more traditional environment hbo comedy central or something like that where there's more kind of on the uh on the hook financially uh, and you have a limited, you have, you know, you have your 24 hour schedule on your channel. That's it. And 13 um, of those is South Park. Yeah. Um, and so uh, you, they're, they're probably much more selective with what they do. Netflix doesn't have to be because you can watch whatever you want and it's right. cheap to produce. And I think that a lot of this stuff maybe is not ready, ready for it, but you know, who am I? What am I? Some sort of comedy critic over here, but, uh, there's so much of it now that you kind of have to stand out. You have to have a shtick or a right, gimmick or, right. or something like that. And uh, I haven't seen anything yet that uh, that I've that I've been like, oh, yeah, that I really liked that. Like I, we were talking about, what was the guy's name? Uh, Brian, is it Brian Regan? Is that the, uh, where he, he has this thing on Netflix and it's like he's doing this thing and then they have like this floor producer or something who's like going back oh, and yeah, forth with them in their show. Yeah. I just thought, man, that's really odd uh yeah. it's, or the it's, one where the guy didn't have an audience on hbo the guy oh, right right God. right I that was what, brutal i didn't watch that one and and so people are trying you gotta watch that because i i watched it and it was one of those things where i turned it on and i i'd never heard of the guy didn't know what the hell it was and i i started watching i go this sucks so bad Oh, it sucks oh. but i got drawn in because i'm like it sucks so it's like it was like watching Saved by the Bell when you were a kid. You're like, this is sucks so bad, but I gotta watch it because it sucks so yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyhow. Um God, I hope that guy never hears that if he comes on yeah, the show, right. whoever that dude's name is. <laughs> um, but you have to do something. And so I watched that someone we were talking about that, and the guy brings up that uh the three mics thing, and I watched that, and I that was also, I thought, like weird. Um uh, it just didn't really like people are trying to reinvent this or whatever. I don't know what the hell my point of this three story mice. was. What was the point yeah. of three months? Well, what, three I mean, started. Neil, Neil like Brennan's it? actually really fun. He co-created this Chappelle show. Yeah. And I, I really like him. Um, I mean, look, it's all subjective. I mean, there's the reason why there's so many specials out there is that like, look at Hannah Gatsby, that Australian comic, you know about this one? This was she one. She came I, out and quit comedy halfway through the special. I, I don't. I, I think I read about this on like an article on CNN watch about how it. everyone has to watch this yeah. special because it's so I whatever. I quit her comedy before she got to the part where she quit comedy. Yeah, I didn't make I it to where she quit. I quit before she did. <laughs> Nanette, yeah. right? Isn't yeah, Nanette. Going? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so pretentious. Yeah. It's so pretentious. And it is. It's like there's different schools of comedy. But you know what? For a lot of women, they loved it. It was transformative for them. So I don't know. I mean, I guess Netflix just launched like 40 hours in January or something crazy. Hmm. They taped a bunch of them at the, at the uh, Montreal Comedy Festival this past summer. And they're just, they're just, you know, launching comedy out there because, like you said, it's cheap. cheap. You can make a special People for half a million it. dollars. People will be willing to check it out right. and watch it. And, and, uh, and that's, I don't know. I know I had something really poignant to say. There was a point to that story, but I completely Is it got... that you want to do a one-hour special? Ah, yeah. Well, hell, why not? Netflix will probably pay for that. They're paying Four for mics. everyone else. <laughs> I, I don't know what the... Uh, but but maybe I was... That was my long way of asking... Uh, what what you have what you're thinking about now that the the, the serious show wound down uh do you have plans for something you want to do in the future or try in the, in the well future? i've got another one hour special i i just i just i have to show uh netflix the the hour they want to see the material so i just recorded it 
I worked on it for like a year, and then I recorded it in Denver, and so I got to show it to them. But like, there's no there's no gimmick. It's just a a middle aged straight white guy telling jokes mm-hmm. about his family. You're not hanging upside down. You're not telling jokes while you're skydiving. No, I or sort of don't. Like I don't really feel like that's. If I were to do that, it would feel forced. I mean, I feel like I've been doing comedy for 30 years, and I think I'm good at it. And I think that it's people are going to watch it, and hopefully they're going to like the substance of it. It's why I'm still on the road all these years. And, you know, I feel like that should be enough. Someone asked me to uh, send me a text message. They, they said to ask uh, Greg Fitzsimmons about doing Burt Kreischer's cooking show. Oh, yeah. Burt has come on the show many, many times. He's yeah. a crazy... Uh, when he first started coming on, I go, this guy is like, it's a put on. It's he's, he's trying to come off as like the party guy. This is his, this is how he wants. This is a shtick. Then we got to know the guy pretty well. And I go, this guy, I mean, that's no joke. I don't know how someone can drink like that. I I mean, it's, it's really drink like that and then work out like that. Right. And then parent like that. When he told me, I'll tell you uh, one of the reasons why I was skeptical about Burt Kreischer when I first met him was, Ralphie May. Ralphie May used to come on the show quite right. a bit for many, many years. And I, I liked Ralphie May, uh, but Ralphie May was a, um, I hate saying this, rest in peace. He was a liar. He was a, yeah. a, 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 a chronic liar, wouldn't you say? Uh, yes. Yeah. What did he uh, lie about? Oh my God! His uh, weight, everything, just all sorts of, yeah. all sorts of stuff. Just, but I think that that really came down to and it, I don't dislike Ralphie I really like Ralphie I think that Ralphie I think that that to psychoanalyze him to some extent I think that he lied because he was uh uncomfortable with himself and um probably had low self esteem uh, if I had to guess uh so Bert I thought might be one of those guys when I first met him and this guy is 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 on our our tour bus and he's drinking like 12 beers in in an hour or whatever and then you know and he's god knows what this guy weighs and he he goes yeah i, I ran a marathon without training and yeah. I go yeah okay sure you did like i i just think of that i go no you can't do that you can't run a marathon without training especially this fat ass <laughs> yeah <laughs> right but then he actually like he 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 actually did that you know like he he's He's not lying about this kind of stuff. Right. Uh, what happened on his cooking show? Well, the cooking show, I forget what it's called, but and, and I forget how you find it. Something's burning. Something's burning. And it's on, like, uh, some some internet channel, I think. It's YouTube. All Things it's Comedy YouTube. is the, okay. the network on But a lot YouTube. of people see it. Like, I got tons of texts from people and, you know, tweets. But um, so you come on, and, and then you cook a certain fast food. And then, but you make it from scratch and then you eat it, but it's really just an excuse to sit there. It's almost like a podcast. So, and shoot the, yeah. And you shoot, you're in a kitchen. So it's me and Beth Stelling and him and we're making Taco Bell food. So we could cook a couple of like famous dishes from Taco Bell and then you, and then you eat them like gluttonous pigs. We're just stuffing this wet burrito down our faces. And then, uh, and then at the end he goes, how should we end the show? I go, I feel like throwing up. I go, why don't we all throw up? And so they got the camera set up. We pull up a garbage can in front of us. And I go, come on, let's do it. I'll go first. And so uh, I stick my fingers down. No, I took a uh, a mixing spoon. And I stuck a mixing spoon down my, oh my throat. God. And I threw up. And then and then Bert started to dry heave. Cause just because yeah, he yeah, sees yeah. you yeah. puke. And so, so he's like convulsing. Next to me, I got puke coming out of my mouth, and they just roll the credits. <laughs> it's like that movie. Well, remember that movie that was it Stand by Me? The movie the with the puke. little kids way back, like 20, 30 years ago yeah. or whatever, and they all start puking at the pie festival or whatever because yeah. one kid pukes and another kid yeah. right. after that. Uh, all right, listen. I've we've been talking with Greg Fitzsimmons for we haven't taken a commercial. This break is in amazing. Like an hour, so I'm sure iHeart is just ready to yeah, uh, to, right. to kill me. Uh, Greg Fitzsimmons going to be at Hilarities tonight at 8 p.m. What do you do? You go back, you sleep during the day, you go take a nap or something? You can't stay up, do you? No, we got we got to do TV now and then some more radio, and then I'll go back. I'll pleasure myself. I'll nap for about 90 minutes, get up, work out, 
write some material, call the wife. Do you write stuff just for your own comedy? Do you do you write yeah, stuff got for a the lot show? Of, you write the HBO? Like, well, what like I work? said, I fit that that hour that I just put on tape. So now I have to write a new hour because once this special comes out, you want people to come out and see a new hour. So that's what I'm working on now, and uh, and so so it's fun. The writing part is fun. I just I take some some Ritalin, take a fistful of Ritalin. Do you really? And then I just crank it out. Yeah, the writing, not your. I've already cranked it out. Yeah. Okay. Because I've taken, I've never taken Ritalin. I've taken Adderall. I, I've thing. never taken, like I'm not. I don't even smoke weed. I'm telling you, if I if I could be on Adderall every day, 24 hours a day, I haven't taken Adderall in years. But to me, there's no negative. There's no. nothing negative with Adderall. The only thing negative is I have to time the crash because after eight hours or nine hours, you can really plummet. Yeah. And I don't want to be going on stage at that time. Yeah. So I try to take it late enough that I'm still on. There's a, one other ne- uh, negative, and that is, speaking of cranking it out, on Adderall, it makes me horny. But for some reason, it's like, it's just, you can, it takes, what normally takes two or three minutes could take 30 minutes now, like, of self-pleasuring if I'm on Adderall. I don't know if it has That's that effect a with everyone. Well, sometimes I just want to, you know, uh, get it, get it over with. with. Yeah. Right. right. I'm not making love to myself. I <laughs> right. don't need to romance myself. You right. know, I just yeah. want to get it over with. And, yeah. And so that is. Uh, and the worst is cycling through different websites while you're in the middle of doing it. Yeah. Because oh, your hands God. are busy. And do, do you ever like you find something and you're like, oh, this is good. But there's always when I'm and I don't, I don't even watch porn that much. But when I if I do. You get all these tabs open, and you're yeah. looking at, and then you have one. You go, oh, I could go back to this, but for some reason, it must just be human nature. You're always thinking there might be something a little bit better yep. than this one, and yep. whatever mood you happen to be in, because I can go, you know, I could be into one thing one day, and then like very, it's it's usually some very specific kind What's of thing. What's your Google search? Oh my God, I uh, I generally like. I like uh, I like weird stuff. I like gangbangs. I like uh, DPs. I like cream pies. Really? I love it. Yeah. Wow. All that stuff. Yeah. Damn, you're yeah. hardcore. I know. Well, see, it- I'm afraid if I go there, I burn myself out, and I have no next level to go to. So I'm 52, but I'm still pacing myself. <laughs> so yeah. here's what. So here's what I've hit, and I'll give you this, and this is gonna. This is you're gonna lock in on this for six months to okay. a year, All right. and you'll watch nothing else. Okay. Japanese hidden camera lesbian massage porn. Japanese hidden camera lesbian massage porn. They're actual spas. Okay. Where women are brought in, and Japanese women, unbeknownst to them, the masseuse is going to pleasure them. Ah. And they do. They work into it very. They. It's like. 15 minutes of a real massage. Right. And then they start to graze certain spots. Parts, right. And you can, and they have like four cameras. One of them is on the woman's face. Yeah. And, and you can see her eyes open wide and she's Asian. So that's hard. <laughs> and then she, or the eyeballs darting back and forth. Like you can see the, the subtlety that they play each part. You can tell it's real. Yeah. There's no Meryl Streep couldn't do could this. not play the sexual <laughs> awakening that happens over a 35 minute uh-huh. massage, uh-huh. ending with full. Well, you'll see how it ends. Okay, All right. it ends different way every time. All right, but it is riveting. You love it. You it's love all it. I've watched for yeah. two years. Wow. Oh my god. Now, have you ever had anything like that in real life? I, I I've never had. I had a buddy who would go to these massage these Asian massage parlors and. And uh, various things. I've never had. I've never gone to one of those places. The, the the closest I came, I was traveling once. I was overseas. I I don't even remember what country I was in. And uh, I went. It was I was at like a nice nice hotel, not some seedy place. And I went and I got a massage. Hot, you know, hot chick or whatever. <clears throat> and she's giving me this massage, and she brushed my ball sack. Just with you know, ever so lightly, uh, once maybe twice, I don't remember. But it was one of those, and then immediately I started thinking: did, was that an accident, or is that a a, a door opening? Yeah. You know, do I? Did, did, is she expecting me to go? Hey, you know, what what is it going to take for a yeah. r- right, right? 
What do you think? Was that like I've and I didn't I didn't do it. I didn't have her do anything. But I don't know. I, yeah, that was the inside fastball. She was going to see if you were going to swing at it. Because you almost can't. Like, if you're a masseuse, you're not accidentally touching a dude's yeah, ball sack. Yeah, professionals, oh, yeah. they know where the touch. That was on purpose. I, I had so. this one time. My my wife, for my birthday this year, she gave me a coupon to go get a massage at this Thai place in Venice. And so I show, and I never That's, got a massage. That just sounds dirty I know. right there, right? Yeah. It's Especially in a mini from mall. your wife. Like. When, once it's in a mini mall and there's like a neon picture of feet, it's always like happy feet. It's like some metaphor. And so I show up, and it was a legit looking place. There's a woman there, little Thai woman behind the desk, and she walks me back to the room with her little Thai feet, her little flip flops. And then she takes me and she goes, take off your clothes and, you know, lay down on the table. And then she leaves the room, and I get naked, I lay down. And then about three minutes later, the door opens and uh, and the, the, the massage begins. And it's like way harder than I could possibly imagine. Like she's going deep, you know, kneading the back of my legs and the calves. And then she works her way up to the butt, moves the towel, heavy oil, and starts working like deep, deep circular motion on the butt cheek to the point where you're like, did I take a dump today? You know, you, <laughs> you start worrying about your hygiene. And so then she's rubbing it. And then. And then, and then she gets to, you know, that little crease between your ass cheek and your thigh, uh-huh. that little smile, yeah, yeah, yeah. she gets her little finger in that and she's working like a pressure point goes further in. And then, like you said, there was a, there was a grazing of the ball sack, a light grazing. And where you really do go like, all right, what was that? Right. Now she goes to the other leg, works her way up, other butt cheek into the smile. Second ball grace. Oh, now you wow. got my attention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then she says, she taps me on the butt and she goes, okay, you turn over now. So I turn over. I look up. Not the woman from behind the desk. Oh, it's wow. a much taller woman. Yeah. Dark hair, lipstick, and what looks like an Adam's apple. Oh, my God. And I'm like, all right, what? I got the bait and switch. What's going on here? And so she starts rubbing the front of my thighs, a lot of oil inside of the thighs higher up and then I started to feel a little something to move something that yeah. the, the towel might have moved. Yeah. Yeah. And I started to not feel in control of the situation. I felt like at that moment, if this gentleman had reached under the towel, I don't, <laughs> I don't know that no was on the tip of my tongue and I'll never know what happened because at that moment, swear to God, the cops ran into the place. You're kidding me. She goes running into the alley. Cop walks into the room. I'm sitting there with a towel and a semi. And he goes, how much did you pay her? And I was like, I was like, I didn't, I, I have a coupon. My wife gave me a coupon <laughs> and I'm like scrambling for it in my pants. You're kidding and me. And then he goes, he goes, just get dressed and get out of here. So I put on my clothes and I'm walking down, I'm walking out and I'm like covered in oil and I, I'm filled with shame. I'm pretty confused. And I open up the door and there's like three cruisers out front with their lights on and a small crowd of people waiting to see what scumbag comes, comes slithering out. out. Right, right. And I'm just looking at him like, I got a coupon. <laughs> and so, so I go home to my wife and I was like, and I told her everything that happened. Yeah. And then she just looks at me and she goes, yeah, I thought it might be one of those places. Wow. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. So your wife, almost, it was she a setup. A, she has a twisted sense of humor. It was a setup. Yeah. You're lucky TMZ wasn't out for, right. outside, the, uh, <laughs> outside the place. Uh, all right. Greg Fitzsimmons at Hilarities tonight at 8 p.m. Uh, tomorrow and Saturday, 7 and 9.30. Here's how you get tickets. 216-736-4242. That's 216-736-4242. Or go to hilarities.com for your tickets. Greg, it's always a pleasure having you in. This is how all radio should be. Thank you so much. It's, Long it's form. the best, right? This is great. I. It's funny because my, my now wife... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, she she was she listens to a lot of different radio shows and stuff only because of me. Yeah. Like, I can't. I don't listen to the radio, so I'll give her sometimes. I'll go, hey, uh, why don't you listen to this station or this show or whatever? See what's going on, or or I'll read that like a, a radio show has picked up uh, s- some new affiliates or something. I'll go, why don't you? Are these guys any good? Why don't you listen to this? Right. She was listening to a, a guy. I just was talking to him on the phone. That's why I go, hey, why don't you listen to this guy's show? This guy, uh, uh, Elliot, in uh, Washington, D.C. I was just on the oh, phone. Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I've known the guy for years, and I've, I've, I, not real well, but we were, just had a phone conversation recently. And uh, 
I said, why don't you listen to his show? Because I, I, I'm not real familiar. I don't listen to it. I said, why don't you listen to him? Tell me, tell me what he's all about. So she, she listened. Burt Kreischer was on, and Burt Kreischer uh, goes, you know, this is, uh, you're the favorite radio show that uh, yeah. I come to, come to interviews. And, and of course, Bert has told us <laughs> yes, that. Of course, everyone says that. And she's like, Bert Kreischer is like, it's almost like cheating on you. I go, ah, yeah. that's all right. Just like I tell Bert Kreischer, he's the funniest. And Greg, I'm, but I'm telling you, you're actually the funniest guy that we, that we ever you have are, on the show. You are the top two radio <laughs> show that I come into. Uh, well, you're in the top two. Who's number one? I always say top two because if somebody else is listening, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's them, right? That's of right. course, that's right. Uh, Greg, uh, have fun this weekend, and I uh, appreciate you coming on. Go see him at Hilarities all this weekend. Uh, we will be right back on Rover's Morning Glory. Hang on, Rover's Morning Glory.